Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Josh Hunsinger. Once again, welcome to our fourth uh, Deputy Commissioner and Sealer oral exam uh, training se session. I'm uh, very glad to see, uh, once again, great attendance. Uh, this session will focus on the administrative civil penalty process. Uh, the last round of oral exams this last spring had a question about that, and we saw some real variation in how people were able to answer that question. I think a lot of that has to do with variations from county to county. In some counties, the inspector level staff write the uh, notice of proposed action themselves when they find a violation and then follow that through with testifying at a hearing and being involved throughout the process. In other counties, uh, what we observed is that the deputy writes the notice of proposed action and carries it through for the most part. And so inspection level staff trying to interview for def deputy exams, uh, they're really at a disadvantage. So we really wanna get into some basics of the administrative civil penalty process. Um, as, you, as you may be aware, uh, both on the pesticide side and then CDFA's programs, both weights and measures and ag programs, the uh, commissioner and sealer do have civil penalty authority for many of the programs. However, not all programs have civil penalty authority and not all um, even violations within um, each program are things that you can issue civil penalties on. We're not gonna get into that level of detail today, but I highly encourage you to do some research. Um, I know DPR, for instance, has tools on what are citable offenses uh, versus things that only, for instance, DPR can take action on. Uh, CDFA has uh, similar um, similar uh, requirements and similar information available. Um, another thing that I am not going to give you today, but is very much available, is where to look up um, older uh, commission or director's decisions or secretary's decisions. I think it's really important that you, as preparation for your exams, familiarize yourself with how those are written, what analysis goes into them, and um, the differences between a DPR director's decision and a CDFA secretary's decision. Um, so that's something important to, to look at. Um, as always, we do have a CACASA YouTube channel going now. Um, if you go to YouTube and you search CACASA training, it should come up with the CACASA icon, so it's real easy to spot. We have the previous three sessions posted to YouTube. This one will go up either, um, hopefully this afternoon yet. Uh, what I plan to do is send out an email to everyone who's participating in this session and um, that'll have the YouTube link. It'll also have a copy of today's presentation and some other notes. So be looking for that uh, later on this afternoon, hopefully. Uh, with that, um, our presenter today is Mona Montana with um, the Department of Pesticide Regulation. I've uh, worked with Mona for many years and found her to be just an amazing resource um, just the amount of expertise she has and the ability she has to train others in and give them that expertise is really uh, phenomenal. I know uh, she may be retiring soon and that's going to be a real resource that the commissioners are losing with her retirement. So I think it's a real privilege that we have her today to um, give us this training. And um, with that, we'll, we'll go through the presentation. And then if you have questions, please type them out. There should be a little control bar thing that says questions, type them to us and um, I will read them out and we'll try to do our best to answer them. So with that, um, let me get our slideshow going for today and we'll start um, start the presentation. Okay, Josh, thank you. I really appreciate your introduction and uh, I'm glad you sort of did an overview of what goes on between CDFA and DPR regarding administrative civil penalties. Um, you know, I'm going to go into the history a little bit on the administrative civil penalty process as it applies to our two departments. I mean, many of you remember when we were part, DPR was part of CDFA. And in 1983, we originally got administrative civil penalty authority for the structural civil penalty program. And part of the reason for that 
was that district's attorney just weren't able to or didn't have the resources to give attention to some of our cases because they had other more serious, I don't want to say more serious, but you know, more um, crimes against people um, going on. So we were granted a, a wonderful gift by the legislature, which allowed us to do an administrative civil penalty action against a violator. And by administrative, we mean it's the action taken by an, another government agency other than the courts or the district attorney. So many agencies have this administrative civil penalty authority, and it allows us to fine violators. The original intention of this law was to try to get the attention of the violator before um, an, a licensing action became necessary or a criminal action became necessary. And so the idea is to try to get a positive behavior change. It's one of the reasons our fines are under the $5,000 range, and originally they were under the $500 range. And in 1984-85, we got authority for, this, for the agricultural civil penalty process, which broadened the um, whole process. The nice thing about this, it's the nice thing, it's the blessing and the curse. Uh, the blessing is, is that we're not under the Administrative Procedure Act. We were just kind of left to our own to develop these programs without a lot of rules being put in the laws and regulations. Um, the, the, the curse of that is we have to be really careful with it and not abuse it and not um, assume we have authorities that we don't when we're using this process. Um, it's also one of the difficulties that we don't have all these rules because everyone wants to know the rules and it's hard for us to say what all of the rules are. We kind of just play it as it goes. But we have a lot of experience in this. We've done this for over 20 years. And so we, um, we're, we're doing this on a regular basis. You know, the commissioners take approximately 1,100 to 1,300 civil penalty actions in the pesticide arena alone per year. And that includes the agricultural and structural civil penalties. I'm not sure what they're doing at CDFA, but I know that it's become a valuable tool for the Weights and Measures program and direct marketing and organics, and I believe quarantine's using it as well. So that's sort of the, the background on the administrative civil penalty process. So what happens when you find a violation? Let's go into that. Let's go to the next slide there. Okay, so you're out in the field and you're an inspector and you're performing field inspections and you observe a violation, what do you do then? Um, you know, you'll find violations based on your routine inspections or special um, inspections or focus inspections or you might get the, do, find a violation as a result of an incoming tip or complaint. Um, the inspection forms are nice in that they're intended to, trig to trigger the inspector to look for certain things in, within the realm of possibilities of the type of inspection they're doing. But um, they're not all the documentation you're going to need if you're going to do a civil penalty action later on. And you never know which violation is going to become the civil penalty action. So you kind of need to address um, the violations as you see them out in the field, and then you're going to need to come back into your office and discuss it with other people on your staff, probably your supervisor, before you go ahead and take an action. Um, inspection forms are a really easy way to document what the inspector observed, and they provide a document that is prepared by the government official, that's you, at or t near the time of the um, activity. And that is one of the things that leads into an exception to the hearsay rule, which will come in later when you go into a civil penalty action or a hearing for a civil penalty action. So you need to be making notes. You need to have other forms of documentation that includes your cameras. It includes um, any statements you write as a, in supplement to the inspection or as an attachment to the inspection or in your comments box. Other sources of documentation are the codes themselves. They might tell you what to look for and what type of evidence to collect if you look at those code sections carefully. So, you, you know, when you're out in the field, your immediate documentation is critical. Don't wait a few days to write your, um, your observations. So we'll go to the next, next slide. So generally, there's a few types of enforcement actions. And um, basically, we have 
types of actions where due process is not required. Um, Noncompliance noted on an inspection form. There's no, due, no, non, there's no due process required there. You just mark it. It's what you saw. It's your impression. Um, or an actual violation notice, a separate violation notice or a notice of violation letter. You are just giving them notice of what you think you saw out in the field. Things that might require due process are cease and desist orders or stop sale orders or prohibit harvest or orders. Those because someone may need to continue doing business or continue with whatever process they were working with, but that doesn't mean that they just get to go ahead and do it. If you've got an order, it's a valid order, it's signed by the commissioner or someone who's authorized to sign on behalf of the commissioner. So that, at that point, if someone requests due process or a hearing, you might have to provide that. And then we have things that definitely require due process. It's, I mean, you know, levy of a fine, such as the programs we're talking about, and pesticides, structural, weights and measures, organics, direct marketing or quarantine, or any others that could pop up later on. And um, you also need to do it whenever you're doing a licensing action, when you're suspending, revoking, um, or conditioning a, a license. Um, so the things that require due process are your administrative civil penalties. If it goes to the district or city attorney or circuit, or circuit prosecutor, they will provide due process. Or you, when you refer um, a state agency for licensing action, then we would have to provide due process. Um, at DPR, we have those three categories there. Um, We call them something a little different, and I will hit that later since we've moved to the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. okay, let's go back to enforcement options then. Okay. Go back one. Okay. Um, at, at DPR, we call the due process not required actions, we call those compliance actions. We call the may require due process public protection actions because you need to immediately protect the public or something. And the um, requires due process, we call those enforcement actions. Um, sometimes uh, people think that public protection actions, such as cease and desist orders or stop sale orders or prohibit harvest orders, um, they think that they're enforcement actions. You know, there may be a difference of opinion between CDFA and DPR on that, but for DPR, we believe those um, are public protection actions and not actually an enforcement action. Okay, next slide to analysis. So you've discovered the violation out in the field, and now you need to go into the office and have a little discussion. You know, you need to be able to talk about the violations that were observed, and you need to be able to show how they were documented, and then you need to look at each one of those, those code sections where you believe you have a violation, and try to pick out the elements, elements of that particular violation or the things that you're going to need to prove. Um, you might need to um, do this on a worksheet or a piece of paper. If you don't do it on a regular basis, it, it's kind of difficult, but if you start doing it on a regular basis, you'll find it's a really good skill. It's a good analysis skill, and it'll be very helpful to you. Um, I will have more on that towards the end of our presentation here today. So once you find out what things you have to prove, then you need to look at the type of evidence that you need to prove that violation. And you should be able to link each element or each thing that you've decided has to be proven to a, to a document or what somebody said. So you might have a, um, you might have a situation where you have photographs. It might be the inspection form. It might be what the um, farm worker said to you or what the broker or dealer said to you. Um, you know, if you've written that down on your inspection form or in your diary or your work diary, or if you've written it on a supplemental form or just your notes, then you might have something there. You need to figure out what type of action to take. Sometimes when you analyze that code section and you look at the evidence that you have, you might find out that a code section might require you to have or prove four different things, and you may only have evidence for two of those things. At that point, it's wise to not try to do a, um, an administrative civil penalty action, but instead stick with um, a compliance action, so such as just you know the dread letter of warning or the violation notice or something like that. 
And then um, I'm not sure about how difficult this is at um, CDFA, but at DPR we take our fine classes very seriously. And um, we have a pretty well-defined um, description of the fines. And they're just vague enough to be able to allow you to do a lot of different things with them. And that's a source of frustration, but it's also a source of great freedom if you look at it that way. So and Mona, need to analyze. Yes. If I could chime in there, just, Please. just I think this is one of those places where candidates would, you know, do well to do some research. But I think one difference, uh, DPR defines what the what or or I guess the way DPR asks you to determine the fine class is more along the lines of what potential for harm the violation posed. Where CDFA goes a little bit different in some of their guidance and it's often tied to a specific code section. So code section okay. one, two, three, four is generally a moderate violation. That's right. I, I can in my mind's eye I can see the weights and measures program regulations there. Yeah, so well, some of the CDFA stuff does have descriptions yeah. of severe, you know, potential to cause harm similar to the DPR guidance, but some of it's also, or quite a bit of it's tied to specific, if you violate code section 1234, it's a moderate violation. So just wanted to throw yeah. that out there. That's good, that, that's good. But the, you know, the takeaway from this is, is that if, if you've got a tool in the regulations that tells you what to do, then follow that tool. And if you've got a tool in the regulations such as a fine description, use that tool. And make sure you're using the right tool for the process that you're involved in. Um, we often get phone calls from our own staff and, and commissioner staff about, well, why, you know, there, nothing bad happened. It was just the possibility. It's like, well, you know, if you look at our code sections and our description, it tells you that it just has to be a hazard, a source of danger. And so look at those, I mean, remember to go back and look at those fine guidelines or enforcement response guidelines. Whichever program you're in, there should be some guidance there. And try to stick with that, because that stuff's pretty well tested. Um, outside of the departments. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So let's say you decide to take your action and you're going to take an administrative civil penalty action. Then um, you have to do a NOPA. So what's a NOPA? It's the Notice of Proposed Action. And the Notice of Proposed Action is basically the, the accusation, they would call that in the criminal world. It's basically it says, um, this is what we're going to do to you, and this is why. So the notice of proposed action is all part of due process. Um, a person who has a government agency coming against them to take away their property or their rights or um, their licensing status or to change the licensing status in some way has the right to due process, and that is the process that is guaranteed to them or that is due to them in the Constitution. So how do we do that in practical terms? What goes in the Notice of Proposed Action? Well, number one, it needs to be on county letterhead to show that it's coming, legitimately coming from the county. You have your, your greeting, your date. You have your document of title, Notice of Proposed Action, an opportunity to be heard, or something like that. Um, you need to have the total proposed fine up near the top so that the person can kind of, you know, at a glance know the severity or the gravity of this issue that's coming before them. The, um, you have to represent the commission's authority to fine. Um, you know, at DPR we have four different code authorities for fining. We generally only use two of them, but at Food and Ag you've got several of them as well. You have to um, have a, you have to note your authority on the Notice of Proposed Action. Um, if there's any fine, gui fine uh, regulations, you need to note those as well, or any policies regarding the fines. You need to provide copies of the code sections that are referenced within the, the Notice of Proposed Action. And this may be an issue where different counties and different programs may differ. Some, some people are fine with um, just noting the code section. Some people are fine with um, doing a paraphrase, and some people want to put the whole code section. At DPR, we try to encourage people to put the whole code section, the entire code section there, because not everybody has access to the internet. Not everybody nears, lives near a law library or a public library. You know, I used to live in Blythe. Uh, good luck finding a code section out there before the internet. So 
you know, you need to provide that information to help that person understand why they're being fined and, and what the gravity is and how much they're being fined. That you're not just being um, capricious or arbitrary. You need to inform the respondent about their right to review evidence. And he, you have to tell them how to request the hearing. You need to give them um, a statement about failure to request a hearing and what's going to happen if they don't request a hearing. Um, basically, they waive their rights. Um, you need to give a little bit of appeal information in the notice, original notice of proposed action, but more specific uh, appeal information may go later once there's a hearing and it might be attached to the commissioner's order and the commissioner's decision. You need to have a, a, a commissioner's order to pay the fine signed by the commissioner attached to that notice of proposed action. You need to have a hearing request form or the actual procedures on how to request a hearing. You might want to um, attach a stipulation and waiver to order, and that is that should be signed by the commissioner. And that is just a form that says, hey, I, I'm, I'm not agreeing to anything here, but um, I'm just going to send you a check, and I'm signing off on that one. And there's always lots of questions generated by that, and I'll wait to hear them before I go into that. Um, you need to have instructions about where to mail things where to mail checks, forms, whatever's in the action. Um, and for DPR, you need to attach a brochure called Preparing for Your Administrative Pesticide Penalty Hearing. And that is so that we can comply with a court order from the um, California Court of Appeals. And now I know I've listed off a lot of things that need to be on here, and some of you are probably scrambling to take notes. Um, I have this written down in another version of this slideshow that we're looking at, and uh, Joshua will get that to you later. So if you miss something, don't worry. Let's go to the next slide. So who's the hearing officer? Um, if you're a commissioner, you need to find a hearing officer. You, the commissioner can hear, hear the case themselves if they believe that they can be fair and unbiased. Most commissioners don't want to do that for obvious reasons. You know, sometimes there's a conflict of interest or a perceived conflict of interest or you know, the commissioner is appointed by the Board of Supervisors, and you just never know, know what's going to happen there. So it's completely understandable when a commissioner doesn't want to be the hearing officer. Um, there's some options there. You can trade within counties. Many of you do that. You might trade within programs, or you might trade with the county next door to you for a hearing officer. Or you can go to Dave Robinson at Merced County, and he's in charge of the um, CACASA hearing officer um, fund for contract hearing officers. And that money comes, the money to pay for those hearing officers comes from the residual mill. So you, you will need to locate a hearing officer if someone does request a hearing. And then you have to have an advocate. And typically it's a deputy, not always. Um, someone who can be pretty confident in presenting information. Um, and the advocate will present the, the county side of the case. And the advocate has a lot to do. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on advocacy here today, but you generally want to be a staff person who has pretty good analytical skills and um, isn't, um, I don't want to say afraid, um, isn't too concerned about presenting information before a, a group of people. And um, because you can expect that if, they, if a respondent comes to the hearing, requests a hearing, and comes to respond comes to hearing, they might present uh, an alternate view of what they believe happened. And so the advocate also needs to be a person who can kind of um, react to things and think on their feet. So if you have the hearing, the hearing officer will be in control of that hearing. The hearing officer after the hearing will issue or write a proposed decision for the commissioner. And uh, the commissioner will then either accept or not accept or modify that decision. And there's a lot to that, and I'm not going to go into all those details today. It's, it's really not that easy for a commissioner to modify a decision. But there are times when it is completely appropriate and acceptable. Then the commissioner will issue their order, which is basically they um, are adopting the fine, and the fine and they say the fine is due now and payable. So and most times you will get a check not long afterwards. Occasionally, people don't want to pay up, and there are lots of options there for when people don't pay, pay up. You can go to the um, county or clerk of the superior court 
and get an order from them if you take some documents to them, or you can run it through your county's own uh, collection process, or when they come in to apply for their restricted materials permit, at least on the pesticide side, um, it can be denied. So under certain circumstances, but those are ways that you can enforce that, that order and that payment. So let's go to the next slide, which I've kind of put here together as a hearing process two steps. So we talked about the NOPA, the respondent requests a hearing, the commissioner schedules a hearing officer and a hearing date. There are different hearing dates and amount of times before someone can request a hearing in the various programs. You really have to pay attention to those dates because they, they can kill you if you, if you get the wrong dates. Um, when you get to the hearing, the adv advocate um, gives their opening statement, then the respondent. There's a presentation of evidence by the county, then the respondent. And then the respondent gets to, to do their thing. And then there's closing arguments, which are short. The hearing officer will close the hearing and close the record. And at that point, no other information can be taken by the hearing officer or anyone else. Once that hearing is over, the record's closed. They can't come back and say, oh, oh, I forgot about this. I need to submit this. So start, they will start calling the hearing officer and ask him to take other things. And the hearing officer will not take them. So. Then the hearing officer will review the record. And by the record, we mean um, the recording, um, the audio, or, or uh, using other media. Um, and they'll write a proposed decision for the commissioner. The commissioner will review it, finalize it, and prepare the order. And the commissioner mails the decision in order to pay the fine the respondent. And then you're done for a while. Unless, next slide the respondent doesn't like the commissioner's decision, and they decide to appeal. The way appeals work are as a person has a certain number of days to make their appeal, has to be in writing to the director, or in CDFA's case, the secretary, or if it's a structural civil penalty, to the disciplinary review committee. And they make, they make their appeal to them. They are not allowed to bring up new issues in their appeal. They basically have to appeal saying that you know what, what the hearing officer found was incorrect or they did something legally wrong. They have to provide some sort of grounds for that hearing. And as a commissioner, you just kind of have to sit until that happens. Now, the minute DPR or CDFA get that appeal from the respondent, they will be contacting you because they're going to need to get a hold of the record of the hearing and the case file, whatever, whatever the case file or whatever documents or exhibits were presented as evidence and accepted as evidence in the hearing. So you, you will know when there is an appeal. Um, also, one of the requirements for CDFA or DPR's appeals, I'm not sure about CDFA, is that they also must notify the commissioner that they're appealing in addition to sending it to the director at the same time. So. Um, that, that's a little technicality, but it's important that you know what's going on. And so the rest of the appeal process is that if, if the appeal goes in the way of the respondent, few of them will appeal to the Superior Court. We had one case where someone did appeal to the Superior Court anyway. We always never know what people are going to do. But um, the next level of appeal is to the Superior Court. And the Superior Court will make a decision. If it doesn't go the way the respondent wanted, um, then, or the, the loser wanted, they can appeal to the California State Court of Appeals. Um, occasionally, cases will be lost, might be one at the commissioner level and one at the director level, and then might be lost at the superior court level. That does happen once in a while, but I'm not aware of any time ever DPR or CDFA going to the Court of Appeals and losing. Because then you get down to the real law stuff, and that's in our favor. So this whole process really is in the favor of the counties and, and the state. There's a, a pretty low burden of proof. The, the burden of proof is called preponderance of the evidence. And that means more than 50% or 50 and 1 1 millionth of a percent. Or another way to put it is more likely to have occurred than to not have occurred. Having said that, that doesn't mean you need to get slack with proving your cases. You know, shoot for 95 or 100 percent in preparing for your case. Shoot for it as if it's the most important thing on earth, because 
you know, it's just not good when you lose. And sometimes you will lose for strange reasons that you won't understand or that were out of your control. And um, there's just so many variables that can go into the legal part of this, which, you know, frankly, none of us have really been trained for except the attorneys. And know that even if you do what we call a lose or a modification or appeal or something, you have won in that you have started a dialogue with this person that lets them know that this is a serious thing and that there are serious consequences for not holding up or not for them not completing or, or fulfilling the requirements that they're required to by the laws and regulations. So a lot of times when there is a loss like this, it does start a dialogue between the commissioner and the violator or the, respond, the original respondent. And they may end up coming to the commissioner more frequently to figure out ways that they can comply. So um, please, you know, it will happen occasionally. Um, some of our regulations are pretty darn complicated. And it just shows that the system is fair and that it's flexible and it's meant to work. It would be easy for us just to uphold everything, but, you know, um, we want to, you know, show our integrity and our ethics, and that's why sometimes things will happen that it will be frustrating for you. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and that's a presenter note. I've kind of done an, um, a general overview of the process. I'm going to have this particular presentation with notes, with my presenter's notes on it. And in this slide on the presenter's notes, I'm attaching in the presenter notes the brochure on how to prepare for your administrative pesticide penalty hearing. And the reason for that is it's a very good description for the layperson of how the hearing process works. It's written for the respondents, but it's also beneficial for um, staff and commissioners to, to know it and take a look at it. DPR requires this on any of our cases because of a case called Patterson Flying Service versus DPR. And we won that, but one of the um, outcomes of that was that we had to provide more information on our notices of proposed action. And this was the easiest way to do it. So we have a brochure, which you need to attach to any pesticide um, notice of proposed action. Um, I'm not sure how CDFA feels about it with their programs. So we've got that in the presenter's notes. And then this is all text, so it's not as pretty as the brochure itself. But following that, we have um, a selection from the hearing officer workbook and the recent hearing officer training we did about code analysis. Um, we call it elements of the violation, but it's just based the seven basic steps you need to follow when you're analyzing the code section. And then following that, there's a third item, which is a page that's kind of from the middle of a notice of proposed action called important information. And that goes over all the rights that the um, respondent has. Like you have, they have the right to review the evidence against them. They have the right to request a hearing, how to request a hearing, the failure to request a hearing, the option to stipulate to the action and pay the fine, and the basic appeals stuff. And then we'll go to the next slide. And this is just optional, two slides, I'm sorry. Okay. Optional reading. And the, the next slides are optional. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through them. I'm not even going to show them up on the screen. Um, the, we talked about enforcement options, the three types of actions at DPR, which I mentioned before, compliance, public protection, and enforcement. Uh, the two or the four civil penalty processes for DPR. This is all DPR specific. Important code sections for DPR. And the last page, if we, want, uh, if we want to go to the last page of this presentation, Josh, time permitting and questions. So I'm good for questions now. Okay, let me uh, pull that up and let me see if we have questions yet. So. Okay, let me see. Okay, hold on one second. So what what is the main difference with the, the DMS civil administrative process? So weights and measures violations. Um, you want me to give that a try? 
Mona? Sure, and then I'll pop in if I need to. Okay, so I, th I think the big differences it are, uh, you know, obviously the nature of the violations will be completely different from a pesticide or a certified farmer's market or a quarantine violation. Um, that goes without saying. Uh, the big thing to remember, and I think it's something we that Mona just covered a, a second ago, is each type of civil penalty process has code that grants the commissioner or sealer authority to, uh, to issue an administrative civil penalty or a NOPA. So, you know, obviously within the business and professions code, weights and the sealer has the authority to issue um, its civil penalties for various weights and measures violations. So that's, that's fundamentally uh, probably the biggest difference. The process itself is uh, nearly identical. The NOPAs look a little bit different just because they have um, different authority. You know, they, they gain their authority from different code sections. But overall, that boilerplate, you know, the letter, all the stuff Mona went over, the letterhead, the, you know, the sealer propose, proposes you to, proposes to fine you for a violation X, Y, Z, the code section that cited at, to tell you about the violation, all of those rights to um, hearing and rights to appeal and the order and stipulation, those things are fairly similar. So Mona, did you have anything to add? I did. I, one thing I, I skipped um, when I was going through my list of things that need to go and notice the proposed action, I imagine this is true for all the programs, you need to give the factual circumstances of the violation. Um, you need to say what happened, when it happened. You need to provide enough facts so that that person can figure out what probably happened or the date and that type of stuff. It doesn't need to be 20 paragraphs long. Most people can do it with people who have practice can do it in one or two paragraphs. Um, and if you stick to what the code says in determining what the elements of that particular violation are, like a tick of four or five things or two things, and kind of frame your facts around that, you'll find that you can make it much shorter than, it, than writing and writing and writing forever. You don't want to give them so much information that you're practically giving them the entire case file. It really is on such and such a da such date, I was there, you were there at this address, this is what I saw, this is the violation. Um, also involved in this violation was your employee, you know, you know, Lucy and Ricky, your employees Lucy and Ricky, and um, this is what they should have had on, and the fine for this is blank dollars. And then you explain the fine is determined by whatever thing is making you do this fine a particular way. In our case, it's the fine regulations for DPR or, um, well, or perhaps a policy if a, if a particular group hasn't developed specific regulations concerning fines yet uh, for some of the newer programs. But try to keep your notices of proposed action um, as short as you can, but provide enough information so the person has a fighting chance to figure out how they're going to defend themselves if they come to a hearing. Yeah. That's part of due process. Good. Yeah, another part of that question I'm just – the format mm -hmm. is kind of funny. It would be the fine structures. Um, there again, each uh, each code section that grants you authority also sets fine structures in place. So I, I believe weights and measures fines only go up to $1,000 right now. Pesticide fines go up to uh, 2000 or I mean 5000 excuse me. Mm -hmm. Some of the quarantine violations go up to 2500 So you really need to familiarize yourself with some of those basic. And I think even in an oral exam, they're not going to ask you, you know, what's the maximum fine at a, at a class B violation for a pesticide violation. That's not necessarily what's going to be looked for as much as familiarity with the process and the fact that, okay, weights and measures violations, the BMP code talks about what those fine limits are. Pesticide and ag stuff, it's going to be in the food and ag code where you're going to be able to find information on that. So those fine levels do vary depending on the particular program and that code section that gives you that, gives the sealer or the commissioner that authority. Um, next question I think is a good one. Who presents the investigation during the hearing? The advocate, and I think they're 
saying the advocate versus the inspector who did the inspection. You want to take that one, Mona? Sure. Um, there should be an advocate to present the case at the hearing. Um, if you're in a larger county, you probably have a person who can do that and then have another witness for the person who might have been the person out in the field. There are times when you're in a smaller county, you might be the chief cook and bottle washer, so you might be the advocate and the witness. Um, the county needs to present that evidence however they decide to do it. Um, the one thing I would caution about is that if you are an advocate and you are presenting evidence or testimony about what you saw and you're not asking another witness who's sitting on the stand, you need to actually turn to the hearing officer and say, look, I'm the advocate here, but I'm also the witness to what happened. So, and I would like you to consider what I'm saying here as a witness statement. And I'm happy to entertain, when at the proper time, I'm happy to entertain questions from the respondent or you about things that I have said here. Um, that's because, you know, technically, um, the advocate doesn't testify. Um, the, it's the witness on the witness stand who testifies, but we know that that's impossible in some situations in the smaller counties. Or you may only have one person assigned to the pesticide program, and that may be the person you want to be the advocate, and maybe the person who saw everything or you know developed the case. The thing is that you need to make that clear to the hearing officer that you are testifying. Otherwise, some hearing officers will literally tune out everything the advocate says from either side, respondent or um, county, and they will only listen to what was presented actually as, as evidence coming from a witness or documents or, or um, documentary evidence, physical evidence, etc. So. It's a tough thing, you know. Um, you really have to think on your feet if you're going to be the advocate. The county always goes first because it's their case. So, so is it is it fair to kind of think in an ideal situation, the advocate kind of acts like if you're watching Law and Order, like a prosecuting attorney, and, exactly. and the field inspector is like a witness that's called to the stand and is interviewed by the prosecuting attorney. That is the, the that is the lovely situation we'd love to see having the the advocate be someone other than the biologist who was there who did the inspection. Um, that that's that's great if you can do it. Okay. Next question for pesticide cases are only citable sections citable in NOPAs. So <laughs> is the stuff on yes. the list the only stuff that's fair game? Stuff on the list is the only stuff that is fair game on the citable sections list. We've recently revised it. Um, I, there's a reason for that. Um, it's not that we're trying to withhold code sections from you. It's just that if you look at Food and Ag Code section 12999.5, it actually has a list of things that are general lists. And we've provided code sections within those areas and we've also analyzed each of those code sections. A lot of code sections don't are not are not violations. They might, might be advisory. They might be clarifying. They might be something that's not covered under the authority of the ag civil penalty process or the structural civil penalty process. And that's why we have this citable sections list. Um, there are a few code sections um, on that citable code section list. And I know for you, those of you who are only doing the other programs, I'm sorry, we're talking about something you probably don't know nothing about, so I apologize for that. But um, we do have an exception or advisory column on that citable sections list. It might say state only or CAC only. We have moved many, not all of the sections we do not want you to cite, but have been cited with some frequency in the past to the back of the list. And a couple of those are some of the most frequently cited code sections. And the reason we have done that is that there are problems with those code sections and or they are just so difficult to prove that we just don't really want to go forth with it. So um, And those typically have an alternative code section for the same typically, not always. Yeah, they typically do. I mean, you know, if it's if you can't do one, you can do, you know, you can always do general standards of care. I know everyone hates that because it's so general. But um, I know, for instance, if somebody's not wearing safety glasses, there's about three or four different 
sections you can right. potentially cite depending on the circumstances. Sure. Yeah, there are there there are three or four very specific code sections you can cite for you know personal protective equipment issues. I know people like to go to the the use in conflict with a label. That's a general provision, and you know sometimes it's the only thing that works. So it's not forbidden to go to to use in conflict with a label, but you want to go with the code section most specific to what happened. And if you do that, you will find that those code sections, if you get really specific to what happened, are easier to prove sometimes than the general code section. Sorry about that, folks. Okay. Good. Okay, so next question. Are there any hearing officer trainings coming up in the near future? Do you, do you have do you have to have had the training in order to be an advocate? Good question. You do not have to have the training in order to be an advocate. You don't have to have the training to be a hearing officer unless you are a contract hearing officer on, under CACASA. And CACASA has a list of, of contract hearing officers, and those people have to have attended the hearing officer training. We don't know when we're doing it again, and frankly, I'm retiring in, in a few weeks. So I don't know when it will be done again, but we do have the training set up. It can be done by others. And we do have a workbook that came out of that last um, training session on hearing officers, and that will that's going to flip into volume seven on the hearing source book on the compendium. So there are materials out there um, to help you get ready for it. Um, if, if you're going to be an advocate, I really recommend that you go to some sort of advocacy class there are a lot of people who want to always go to the hearing officer class because they think, oh, I'll know the hearing officer's way of thinking about it. Well, that's fine, but it doesn't cover all the things that advocates need to do. So if you need advocacy training, I recommend you work through your enforcement branch liaison and keep asking for it. You know, the old CDFA thing that I learned when I started working for CDFA 35 years ago was a squeaky wheel gets the grease. So um, just keep asking for it. Yeah, and I would just add to that, you know, Deputies and certainly commissioners and sealers are county management. And one of the skills as a county manager is to work with other county managers and other departments. And so if you can facilitate, you know, typically animal control uses civil penalty process or hearing officers or advocates. Code enforcement often does as well. So there may be training general training opportunities outside of the Ag Weights and Measures PUE system within your county going on too. And that's a real good skill to learn to work with other departments within your county. So you know, and I'd also recommend looking at local cities because cities are going to drug courts and neighborhood courts for a lot of types of violations. And they are training hearing officers. Yeah. Okay, next question. Um, can you explain the appeal process when the respondent appeals the commissioner's decisions? I thought it went straight to the DPR director, and that was the end of it. Thanks. Okay, it goes to the DPR um, for for DPR. It goes uh, when the when the respondent isn't happy with their decision and they want to appeal it to the next level, which is the director of DPR if it's an ag civil penalty, or in the case of a structural civil penalty, it goes to the Disciplinary Review Committee, which is a different thing altogether. It goes to those places. Uh, the director has his attorneys work on it and do a lot of the footwork on it. But I'll tell you, the last four directors we've had have really put, put their stamp on these things. And um, so I would say that, yeah, the directors are very involved, and they do do it, and sometimes they talk to legal and make them change a couple things. So um, I always love it when you can see, I mean, there are times when we can see the director's stamp on something, and it's usually one, they're the ones you basically say, when, when, when you read something that practically says liar, liar, pants on fire, it's probably because the director said something like that. <laughs> Yeah, and just I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, and I think Gary Leslie's on this call, but just my general sense is that I think on the CDFA side, it is probably a little more the attorneys and the um, the division directors that are, um, you know, working on those decisions more than the secretary herself. Yeah, at DPR, um, our assistant directors 
would not be working on it, or the chief deputy director would not be working on it. It basically is the attorneys and the director. Yeah. So I think, okay, let me just, next question. And um, I do want to cut this off at three o'clock, um, but we have a few more minutes. So who determines the advocates in a hearing? Is it the hearing officer, the county who wrote the NOPA? Is there only one advocate for a hearing? Good question. Well, that's determined by, I guess, the, the supervisor of the pesticide and use enforcement program, be it the deputy or the commissioner or whatever. Um, it's not up to the hearing officer. The hearing officer is out of the process. They come in just for the hearing. Uh, they shouldn't be discussing it with you too much, anyone too much before the hearing. Um, we, don't, we don't want to taint the hearing officer. Um, we don't want to call the hearing officer after the hearing and say, well, here's the rest of the story. Um, the hearing officer is sort of a person who's kind of shoved off into like a special area and they're not to be touched. So um, it's really up to the individual county to decide how they're going to work that. Um, some counties have the deputy um, decide. Some counties, someone just says, hey, I want to do this, and they get to do it. So it, it's individual counties. Yeah, I think it's up to each commissioner or sealer to kind of figure out how who's going to advocate on behalf of the county. And then certainly, Mona, the um, mm -hmm. the respondent can have representation too. They're not called an advocate, are they? Well, they can be called an advocate. Um, you know, this is one difference with the DPR program. Um, we recently have come out with it. Well, it will be coming out at the end of the month. A very vague policy, but basically the respondent's attorney must be an attorney or a family member or a person who works in the same company and was involved in the incident. Um, basically, we're trying to um, not have people who don't have any training in the law um, be advocates unless there's a real close relationship there with the respondent. We don't want, you know, the guy who thinks he's the smartest guy in the coffee shop coming in to represent someone because we think they often do a huge disservice to the, the respondent client. We don't want um, consultants from big pest control companies coming in. If they're just a consultant, they weren't involved in the issue at all, coming in and acting as the advocate for the uh, for the respondent because they don't they're not attorneys and. And they really can do their clients big a big disservice, and we want to we want the um, respondent to either do it themselves or get an attorney or get someone who's competent or someone who's so close to them in this matter that um, it won't you know destroy the relationship and that person probably knows more than the respondent. You know we see this a lot with respondents having their adult children or recently graduated from college children come in and represent them. And uh, we don't want to stop that, per se, but we also want to damp it down a little bit and not have people out there saying, well, I can represent you in here. I used to be a commissioner. Or I used to be you know, a chief at DPR or CDFA or something like that. Those people have no business practicing law without a license. Great. OK, next question. Um, how do you basically include um, or do you include uh, compliance actions in a NOPA? Do you use them to make a note of the violations but not taking any monetary? So I think the question is asking, like, would you issue a NOV, for instance, within a NOPA? I'm not sure. I mean, you might refer to an NOV as some, about something that happens if that helps explain the basic facts. I wouldn't attach everything except the kitchen sink. I really would try to keep the notice proposed action uh, and whatever you attach to that relevant to the action you're going for. Otherwise, you risk throwing so many things in there that the respondent never really gets what they did wrong. And it's just more things that you're going to have to defend if the, uh, uh, the respondent brings in an attorney. Um, if, if you're throwing in some old violations just to show why, you know, we went so high with the fine, you know, this guy has a history and going back 10 years, um, then then fine. But um, 
don't put in things that you don't really need that aren't really relevant or germane to the matter at hand if you can avoid it. Yeah, I think no a NLV thick rope is not necessarily better. NLVs might be nice in a hearing to present just to show their pattern, but yeah. They yeah. wouldn't be included within the body of a NOPA, typically. No, unless you're attaching all of your um, documents. Some people want to attach everything, which is absolutely fine. Yeah. Or some people will wait for someone to request that before the hearing, and some people will never take the opportunity to request that information before the hearing and, and walk in and be surprised by everything. Okay. Here's a good clarification question. Uh, mm -hmm. A uh, Is the appeal of a commissioner's decision to on a structural civil penalty who is it directed to? Is it directed to the Structural Pest Control Board? And if so, exactly who at the Structural Pest Control Board? Okay. Appeal, an appeal for a structural civil penalty action is to the Disciplinary Review Committee, but it is mailed to the Office of Legal Affairs at the Department of Pesticide Regulation. Okay. Um, if, if and that's just because that's what we worked out between us and Department of Consumer Affairs before we took over their program. And now that they're back, we're still doing it that way because things just seem to get lost over there. So we just take it by the bull by the horn and um, we'll take the appeal and then we will call them. And the Disciplinary Review Committee consists of three people, a representative of the pest control industry, a representative from the California Department of Consumer Affairs Structural Pest Control Board, um, like some similar to like the, the the enforcement branch, and a an attorney from DPR. So um, the the direct the actions coming out of Disciplinary Review Committee these days are a lot more stable and reliable and less likely to automatically be overturned by the Disciplinary Review Committee as they once were 15 years ago. Those days are kind of over. Um, we've kind of got it through their head and there's been personnel changes, so you don't have to worry that just because someone appeals a structural decision to the Disciplinary Review Committee that's going to get overturned. Um, it doesn't happen often anymore, and when it does, our attorneys will always say, the vote was two to one, and that means they're not going to say that, but they will say the vote was two to one. That means the DPR attorney was the one. So know that you got a vote. So um, it's not so it's not as bad as it once was. I know it's kind of confusing. Um, if you need information on that, go to your enforcement branch liaison, and they have a side by side comparison between ag and structural civil penalty processes. In fact, if you've been to any of my trains, I've handed out something like that in every train I've done for the last 10 years. Great. So we need to we need to get going on this because I have yeah. another webinar I have to jump on. There's a couple other questions I see that are things that um, there are manuals for, you know, there's there's um, there's preparing for your there's a lot of documents, especially on the DPR side that it can answer some of the other questions. Uh, about you know the citable sections that's something find out if you don't know who your county's uh, enforcement branch liaison is find that out ask your enforcement branch liaison about the citable sections and where to find or if it. you go to our website and just type in the word citable in the search bar for DPR you'll get it yeah the last question I'd like you to answer here Mona is if a hearing officer sides with the respondent can the county ag commissioner overturn the hearing officer's decision? Now, let's end with that one. I think it's a good question. No, um, not I'm a, no 99% of the time. Um, that's what happens when you delegate this responsibility to somebody else. They get to make the decision. They were there. They got to see the testimony. They got to see whether or not the guy was looking at the ceiling when he testified or was staring at the floor. The, the hearing officer is the trier of truth and the finder of fact. And the appeals court, if you go three label, levels up, absolutely sticks with that. So they, they give all the great deference to the hearing officer. The only time the commissioner should, make, should change a decision, modify it, or throw some part of it out is when the hearing officer made a legal mistake. Not a factual mistake, a legal mistake. They applied the wrong fine code section, um, or did something bizarre. But there has to be a real legal reason. And when that happens, I would recommend the commissioner call DPR's legal office, and we will try to help you through it. 
Well, thank you very much, Mona. I really appreciate this. I know we had um, we had over 80 uh, participants in this, and so we're going to wrap it up. I, like I said, I will email everyone a link to the uh, YouTube channel and also the um, handouts from today. And so be looking for those in the very near future. And with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, you guys. Go out and go out and knock them dead. <laughs>